Jane Houston again. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Susan Stone. And this is her shortened biography. Dr. Stone has a very impressive biography available at vidm.org, but I'm doing the shortened biography as she has had a very extensive career in midwifery. Sue Stone, Doctor of Nursing Science, Certified Nurse Midwife, Fellow of the American College of Nurse Midwives and Fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, has been working in the field of reproductive health care for women for over 30 years. She is an early graduate of Frontier Nursing University's Distance Education Midwifery Programme and practiced full scope midwifery care for several years. Believing that having more nurse midwives would ultimately serve the goal of improved health care outcomes for women, she shifted her focus to the education of nurse midwives. She has served as president of FNU for the last 16 years. During this time, the university has grown from 200 students to the current enrollment of nearly 2,000 students. Dr. Stone continues in the role of FNU president with a goal of improving health care for families, through increasing the number of well-prepared nurse midwives and nurse practitioners. She is also president-elect of the American College of Nurse Midwives. It gives me great honor to welcome Dr. Susan Stone for our presentation now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me uh, for this presentation this morning. And thank you, Jane, for that very nice introduction. Welcome, everybody from all over the world. It's really exciting uh, to be talking with you today. And uh, I wish almost that we were sitting all around a table together so that I could meet you all in person. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, building our midwifery workforce in the United States um, and why we need to do that. So I'm going to dive right in. In the United States, we're uh, having, uh, we're experiencing increased maternal mortality rates over the last 25 years, and this is a pretty dramatic increase. Um, in 1987, we had a ratio of 7.2 uh, numbers. In 2013, we're 17.3, and uh, the estimated number for 2015 is 26.4, and some, but some, there will be a lot of discussion about whether those numbers are accurate and whether the measurements are um, completely, um, as I said, accurate um, from birth certificate data. Whether they're totally accurate or not, what we do know is that this rate is increasing and has increased quite dramatically, so we do have this problem. We know that about 700 women uh, die each year in the United States of pre pregnancy-related causes. And we also know that the rate of severe maternal morbidity more than doubled from 2000 to 2010. So these are women that land in the intensive care unit, very sick, um, and actually uh, some people call these near misses for maternal mortality. So, uh, so we've got this problem, what's going on here and why in this country where we spend so much money on healthcare uh, do we have this problem? This just is a graph that shows 1987 to 2013. And then this one shows our deaths per 100,000 live births. And in fact, you can see how disproportionate this is when you look at other industrialized countries um, where other countries are going down. In the US, we are going up. So it's quite a disturbing um, situation. So other um, issue you know, details about this are we know that African American women are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy complications than white women. This is a very disturbing fact um, that we need to pay serious attention to. Um, also, women who are aged 35 to 39 are almost twice as likely to die of pregnancy complications than when you compare them to women who are aged 20 to 24. And the risk becomes even higher for women aged 40 and older. So why is this happening? Well, we know in the United States that ex excellent care is available for some, but it's not available for all. And we also know by having examined these deaths that at least half of them are pre preventable 
and probably even more if we really uh, paid serious attention. We have shortages of providers and facilities, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. We have financial, we have bureaucratic transport and language barriers, and we have care that's not consistently culturally appropriate, and it's not always respectful care. We know looking at these deaths, the medical reasons are, um, the top medical reasons are hemorrhage, no surprise there, right? Pregnancy-related hypertensive disorders, infection, uh, pulmonary embolism, cardiomyopathy, and cardiovascular conditions. So these, um, these issues, yes, um, we're trying to deal with those with bundles and emergency um, protocols in hospitals, and there's a lot of work going on around what to do when these things happen. You know, what, are the, what is the step one, two, three, four, that um, is standardized across the United States um, that would really help with these medical conditions. And, um, and, and we are starting to see some progress in some hospitals, but we do need more standardization. We need, need to see this really incorporated across all hospitals, and that's our struggle. Maybe even more important is to look deeper on why these things are happening in the first place. Um, why are, are we in the situation where we have women who get into such bad um, trouble with their pregnancies um, as the pregnancy progresses? You know, the, there's a lot of public health issues. I chose just a few of them to um, uh, detail. The obesity is, um, is a very big problem in the United States. Nearly half of women are obese prior to becoming pregnant and also nearly half gain more than the recommended weight during pregnancy. And, and the obesity, it's a, we have issues around the types of foods, uh, types of foods that are readily available um, and, um, and the increased in um, carbs, not having a really well-balanced diet available and not having maybe the care to help women and, fam and their families know what is the best thing to be eating and that kind of thing. So more public health rather than emergency care may be um, an important thing. Smoking, we still have trouble with smoking. About one in five women smoked in the three months prior to getting pregnant and one in 10 smoked during the last three months of their pregnancies. This information comes from the Center for Disease Control. As you know, you, you do it does make you wonder those are the ones who revealed that they smoked. What about the ones that don't tell us? We also have mental health disorders. About one in nine women had symptoms of major depression during their pregnancy, but only about half received treatment for this condition. And this is, again, we just don't have enough care providers to provide the care, type of care that's needed. Uh, what I didn't put on this slide, but is our opioid addiction problem, which is a huge um, problem in the United States. Let's look at cesarean section. You know, this is a this is a problem. When we are having more than a third of our babies delivered through cesarean section, this is a um, issue that we need to look at and deal with. Um, the rate when a 2015 CDC study showed that rates of maternal morbidity were higher for cesarean delivery than for vaginal delivery. Not, I'm sure none of us are very surprised by that. Uh, studies examined, this particular study looked at four morbidities, maternal transfusion, ruptured uterus, unplanned hysterectomy, and admission to intensive care unit. Maternal transfusion was the most common of the four morbidities, followed by ICU admission, unplanned hysterectomy, and ruptured uterus. Women having vaginal deliveries with no previous cesarean delivery had the lowest rate for all four morbidities. Again, we, I know you're not surprised by that. And women with VBAC deliveries had lower rates of all four maternal morbidities compared with women with repeat cesarean deliveries and lower rates of transfusion and ICU admission compared with primary cesarean deliveries. Oftentimes, you know, we look at, well, I don't know if we, it's not us, but uh, women uh, are becoming coming to a point where they think it doesn't matter whether you have a cesarean delivery or a vaginal delivery. And I think that some of the decisions, well, I don't have to think it, we know it and you know it, some of the decisions we could be decreasing this rate. And every time we pay attention to this rate and put midwives in the situation, 
um, we, we do see a declining rate. I think this is a very important place where we could make a big difference very quickly. And we also have shortages in providers for maternity care. Um, the workforce, because we don't have the workforce that we need, um, this denies women and their families access to highly qualified providers. So we know in 2013, there were about 3.93 million births in the US, and we are projecting that to grow to 4.4 million by 2050. So we know we have an increasing demand um, but we also know that 40% of U.S. counties had no midwife or obstetrician in 2011, and that is climbing, especially in the rural areas. The um, ACOG recently did a workforce study in two, that was published in 2017, and they are projecting to, that they will have a shortage of OBGYNs of between 15,000 and 20, about 22,000 by 2050. Um, they know that less um, residents are choosing um, OBGYN for their specialty. Um, and the, so that we're having a decreasing supply and an increasing demand. And what's going on in our rural areas, we're having more and more hospitals, the small rural hospitals that are closing. And if they're not closing, many of them discontinue maternity care due to legal liability issues and the complexity issues and the inability to recruit um, healthcare providers, OBGYNs or midwives to work in these settings. And also it's, they have um, a greater difficulty with insurance coverage. So what are some of the solutions? We need increased access to primary and preventive care. So, you know, it's the, we put a lot of focus on the actual birth and the hospitalization, but how much focus do we really put in helping women and their families um, to stay healthy? We also need data collection. It's been shown that when we um, really are careful about, I mean, well, let me just talk about that in a minute. I'm going to wait, wait on that. We need to diversify the health provider workforce. We need to work collaboratively to address these issues. We need team care and we definitely need more midwives in the US. So access to care, what does it really mean? So uh, it doesn't, it, when we look at access, there's a few things that are really critical. Um, first of all, to gain entry into our system, the woman needs insurance coverage. And we know that our Medicaid program, which covers low income with women, covers more than 50% of, of the births in the United States. And then we have private insurance, usually provided through employers, um, that covers a, another large percentage, but we still have around 15% that can slip through the cracks. We've made some um, uh, progress with our Affordable Care Act, but we know that we still can have women who slip through the cracks on uh, um, having insurance coverage. We also, it's, a, it's important that there's geographic availability. So if, um, if the clinic is 30 miles away and you don't have a car, it's not available. Um, and also the personal relationship is very important when you're talking about care. If you have a healthcare provider that you can't trust or you feel you can't communicate with, there's not going to be excellent care. So a personal relationship is a really important piece of access to care. And so when we look at the social determinants, again, the service availability, and this can also include hours. We often still have clinics that are open from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon, just at the time when women are at work and can't get there. So that's important locations, hours, and having a consistent care provider. We think that um, care can just be uh, provided by who's ever in the clinic that day um, without any real looking at, is that person who is in that clinic able to have a relationship? Is there any consistency in that care? Um, those kinds of things can make a big difference in, um, in the care that we provide. Um, resources to make use of available services, and this includes 
having the appropriate information, but also having it in a way that's understandable to whoever's receiving that information. So whether it's a language issue or a readability or the ability to just sit down and talk to give information. And the appropriate of services. Ideally, women should be able to choose a provider that they want, whether it's a gender issue, whether they want continuity of care, they want confidentially, confidentiality, um, and um, they want quality care, and they also want cultural sensitivity. It's so important that, um, that providers understand what are the cultural issues that um, attend with each particular woman. These are issues that we often don't pay enough attention to and that we really need to do some serious work on. So here's the data collection issue. It, this is a very important issue that we collect accurate data so that we can identify the key problems and, and create programs to address those problems. This is a big push that's going on. The Center for Disease Control is, um, has programs to help states develop maternal mortality, mortality review um, committees. And um, the goal is that every single state would have one of these review committees and that they would be able to um, operate consistently across the states so that we could see comparative data and um, zero in on where the biggest problems are. And this really works. Um, California is a very good example. They started their mortal mortality review committee 10 years ago. They examined maternal deaths over several years and most reviews identified some chance that the death could have been prevented. They created toolkits to train providers and maternal deaths at hospitals that use the toolkits dropped by 21%, while those that did not use the toolkits fell only 1.2%. Today, California has the lowest maternal mortality rate in the United States. And so there is leg leg legislation pending and that we are advocating for um, that would provide funding to assure that this um, maternal mortality review was available in every state. It, there are in about 26 states right now, but um, they're not consistent. And if they're in, in some states, they're underfunded so that even though they're there, they may not be um, operating at the level that they need to be to be effective. We also need to diversify the health provider workforce. We know that racial and ethnic minorities are very underrepresented in the U.S. healthcare professions, and this includes midwifery. Diversity improves access to healthcare for underserved, and, um, and we know some facts that African American, Hispanic, and Native American providers are much more likely than our white physicians. Now we're talking about physicians to practice in underserved communities and African-American and Hispanic physicians, as well as women, are more likely to provide care to the poor. Racial and ethnic minority patients who have a choice are more likely to select healthcare professionals of their own racial or ethnic background. And racial and ethnic minority patients are more satisfied with their care and are more likely to report receiving higher quality care when they're treated by a health professional of their own racial or ethnic background. This issue is not just a physician issue. When we look at the American College of Nurse Midwives in our membership, now this is the members of our um, college, and we only have uh, about 6% who um, of midwives who identify themselves as midwives of color. And so uh, this is an area too where we are working very hard on that, and I'll tell you a little bit of our strategy in a minute. It's also important that we engage in team-based and collaborative care. And uh, ACOG did publish a great document, Collaboration and Practice, Implementing Team-Based Care. It's a very helpful document if you're um, looking for some principles on how to do this, but it's really important that we work with our colleagues, whether they're physicians, social workers, whatever it is that that patient needs at the time. And um, I like their guiding principles um, because in the first place, it's the patients and the families that are central and engaged in the care. So um, I always had, remember one professor who told me the first thing you do is ask the patient what they think is wrong or what they think is going on, and they'll usually tell you. Um, and oftentimes they can tell you themselves. So, um, but it's just very important. That sometimes we don't include the patient in the decision making. Of course, it's a central uh, um, 
uh, tenant of midwifery care to do that, but this is not in our large hospital systems when things are going on, or even in clinic systems. Sometimes patients are not included in the decision making, and that has to be a central concept. The team has to work together. Rural clarity is essential. Um, we are educated in silos here in the United States where the med medical schools are here, nursing schools are there, midwifery programs are there, and we don't always cross fertilize. So um, oftentimes they won't even, one provider won't even know what are the capabilities of another provider that's in the team. Um, so we're working on a lot of interprofessional education here and trying to get some strategies where we're working um, together, uh, even as students, um, so that we're kind of growing that team from the ground up. And there are some very successful um, practices going on here, um, but we need to see that um, develop throughout the healthcare system more so. We have to also be careful about hierarchies. Um, when you have hierarchies, it gets in the way of um, communication, and then that can cause problems. Um, you know, we know in the United States, I think the latest numbers are something like 180,000 people die from healthcare errors. I mean, it's a tremendous, horrible st statistic. Um, but root cause analysis of that shows oftentimes it goes back to communication and how did the prov people, providers, everybody on the team communicate each other with each other. So think about that. If we just could communicate better, we could improve outcomes. Um, I like the idea in this document, they talk about team leadership as situational and dynamic. So it's not just like the physician is always the leader of the team, it's whoever is appro the appropriate person. So um, the midwife may often be the leader of the team, especially when she's caring for a low risk woman or um, even a woman with complex social problems. She's going to lead that team to make sure that woman gets the best care. If it's a critically ill um, woman in the hospital, yes, then the physician may be uh, the leader of the team. But it's just situational. Whatever that situation calls for is who that leader of the team should be. Okay, so bottom line in the United States, I think we need more midwives. Um, we know that we have about 14,000 midwives in, when you look at the certified nurse midwives, certified midwives, and certified professional midwives in the United States. Um, I have mentioned that we are having increased numbers of births. We do have a slowly increasing number of midwives. Our progress is slow, um, it, and I think we need to increase that. It's essential that we increase the numbers that are graduating each year because we cannot be a solution to this big problem if there are not enough midwives. And I do think when you think about these root cause problems, midwives really can um, make a difference uh, in, this, in the public health issues, the social issues, decreasing the cesarean section. We do in the United States have an increasing number of programs offering distance education options and these programs are increasing their number of midwifery students. At Frontier Nursing University, we have very much focused with a distance education model of um, really recruiting our students from rural and underserved areas primarily. When we look at our graduates, it's around 70% of them are working in rural and underserved areas. We currently have about 900 midwifery students, so we're working on the problem, but we need to um, increase these efforts across the United States. You can see this is the Department of Labor statistics in 2017 shows employment of nurse midwives by state. These are very small numbers, the lightest green being of uh, 30 to 40 in a state. In my state of Kentucky, there's I think 111 uh, nurse midwives. And then um, in some of the even the biggest states uh, and biggest population states like New York and California, so you still might only find a thousand midwives. Um, so we really do need to increase. This is just another map that shows the employment of nurse midwives by area. Uh, and you can just see we're just scattered. We're, there's not really enough of us to provide to be a essential part of the workforce in every single maternity care system. So um, 
we know that we have, if we have increased number of midwives, we'll increase primary care, including maternity care, especially for rural and underserved women. Um, we are the ones that can go into those rural areas, educating um, uh, women or men who live in those areas to be midwives may be a very good strategy because they'll stay and serve those areas. And midwives um, do play an important role in um, um, filling the maternity care sh shortage. Um, we know that most women are able to have normal physiologic births. And so midwives are experts at these at low risk normal births. So um, we honestly should be attending more births than any other provider. Um, just when you look at situational, what the needs of the woman are, or we have the potential to do that, let me say that. Um, but in 2013, CNMs and CMs attended only 8.2% of all U.S. births. And we know we could independently attend a larger portion of normal births. And that would free obstetricians to use their specialized skills to assist women with significant complications. Many countries make much more significant use of midwives than we do as this group would uh, definitely know that. Um, so um, in, a, in a Cochrane review published in 2013, we know midwifery-led care results in better outcomes, less regional anesthesia, fewer episiotomies, fewer instrumental births, fewer cesarean sections, more continuity of care, fewer preterm births, uh, less fetal loss before 24 weeks, higher maternal satisfaction, and a trend towards cost savings. I know that this group knows that, but uh, these, are, these are tremendous outcomes. So um, this could, by increasing our percentage of midwives in the United States, we can increase the diversity. We can focus on different groups that um, need midwives and educate, recruit and educate directly from those groups. So we, that would help with the diversity we can help women stay healthy. And so I think we need to spend a lot more time around primary care and just um, health care um, and strategies to, and it's easy to say to a woman, lose, you need to lose weight and send her out the door, but how do we really help her with the problems that she's having? Of course, we can decrease the cesarean section rate. We can provide more preconception -pre care and we can develop relationships with our patients and this is a critical aspect in increasing access. So in summary, the United States has increasing rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. Associated factors include a lack of concerted effort and data collection and analysis, maternal obesity and other health issues that could be affected through better primary and preventive health care, and as well as um, early identification and treatment of problems. We don't have enough health care providers, especially in rural and underserved areas, and we have too many cesarean deliveries. And I believe an increased number of midwives has the potential to dramatically improve those outcomes. So that's my presentation, and I will take questions. Thank you very much, Susan. That was fabulous. Um, I know that um, those of us who are not in the States don't quite understand the um, <laughs> the multitudes of different roles that people seem to have around the birth process of birth. So uh, there was a little bit of clarification by Cecilia there about um, Thank you, Seal. who is what, you know. Um, so have we got any questions for Dr. Stone? What kind of training, I've asked the question, what kind of training do the labor and delivery nurses have about birth? if they're caring for all these women during labor? That is a very big problem. Uh, you know, we have nurses that are associate degree nurses, so they have two years of training before they start their uh, start working in, um, in nursing. And then we also have baccalaureate, so they may have four years. And then, of course, there's different levels with masters and different um, um, specialties. But generally in the hospital, you will see either associate degree trained nurses or baccalaureate trained nurses and their curriculum may or may not have, don't get me wrong, they all have maternity care. The level of training in maternity care though may vary and it will, in any nursing curriculum, they're trying to cover a complete, um, from birth to death, all types of patients. So there's only a very small portion 
of um, of a specific area in maternity care. So that can you may have nurses that are very well trained, um, and then you may have nurses that are not. And when you look at the rural in the rural hospitals, you're more likely to have the associate degree trained nurses, which who may have a lower um, amount of maternity care. What happens though in most hospitals is there's um, orientation where they the hospital themselves will spend a lot of time um, training. Uh, the nurses after they get started um, for a young brand new nurse, but that varies hospital to hospital too. So there's no standardization. So that, yes, that is a very big problem um, when these nurses are the primary care providers in the hospitals. And if we had more midwives, um, the midwives could supplement that care. They could provide guidance to the nurses or they could do that care themselves. Yes, we find that very strange in the UK where uh, the only people who can actually care for a woman during childbirth is either a midwife or a medical practitioner. You couldn't, the nurses are not allowed to do anything beyond um, first aid, I suppose you could call it. Um, it's uh, fascinating, really. Yes, and I remember and scary, visiting. And scary, scary, I have to say, to think that nurses yes. who have never seen a birth are caring for people in, in labor. How can they identify a problem developing? Because it's can be that's very right. subtle. So that's, that is why we have communication issues. We have uh, problems that get out of hand. Um, you know, I remember, I remember being a very young nurse myself, working labor and delivery. And um, what I had to learn was not to call the doctor too soon because then I would be wasting that doctor's time. And so <laughs> there I was trying to figure it out by myself. Um, so it's, it is a very big problem. I also I like do remember uh, I visited Scotland one day. I was in a, um, a maternity unit in a day room with about 15 of who I thought were the nurses and midwives on the unit. And I said to them, which of you are the midwives and which of you are the nurses? And they said, well, why would we have uh, nurses who are not midwives taking it on this room? It was way out in um, rides, but it was interesting. Yes, there's actually, um, with the issue around um, free birthing, uh, one of the things we often have discussions for in the UK is because we have these very strict rules about a, a midwife or a doctor, nobody else can care for women, does that mean that the husband or partner who is there at the free birth is taking on the role as a midwife and can he therefore be um, um, uh, you know, in trouble for, for taking on the role of the midwife? So it's a very, yes, yeah, sued that, well, not sued, but certainly, um, uh, yeah, get, get in trouble for taking on that role that they're not allowed to take. Yeah, oh, fascinating. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so is there any kind of move? Anybody else got? I'm, I'm trying to um, wait for somebody to ask a question here. Uh, please write <laughs> in the. Would anybody like to take the, the the mic to ask Dr. Stone a question? I can think of hundreds, but that's not my role. Sorry, this is Linda Wiley. I've taken over for Jane, who's gone off to do to a graduation. Thank you, um, Linda. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm here anyway. I don't, I don't get much sleep during the IDM because I don't like to miss anything. <laughs> Susanna here has su suggested that one-to-one -one care is not possible then. Well, it is, you know, and we do have um, lots of very high-functioning midwifery um, practices in the United States. There are examples in many places and uh, very, it's, um, so you, you can find hospitals where uh, a, a woman is cared for by that midwife during her pregnancy and then comes into the hospital with her. Also in the freestanding birthing centers, that's a very common model where the midwife stays with the woman throughout the birth. Um, and it's a really great model. And that is another area where we're showing um, the, uh, really good outcomes in the freestanding birthing centers. Uh, you know, we just, I really do, think that if we we have got to increase the role of the number of midwives the sheer number um, because there's many towns and places where there's just not midwives available at all yes thank you the home birth is also growing here in the in the united states um, and uh, and so that, of course that's another model where there is one-on-one -on -one care did you see that question about uh, above um, gosh i don't know how to go above on this thing 
um, from Jade. What is the role of hospitals versus academic institutions? Can't get it to stay there. <laughs> uh, in terms of training up new midwives because of the difficulty with clinical placements and getting good preceptors or mentors. Yes. Well, you know, that is our limiting factor and because there are not enough practices there to be to act as preceptors. So we can't just have a large number of students without any midwives to train them, if you see what I mean. So it is important that um, that that midwives, all of our midwives, do accept the responsibility to precept students, whether they're in birthing centers, home birth practices, or in hospitals um, or clinic situations. Um, that would be really important. So our 900 students, so the way we do it is it, at Frontier Nursing University is we front load their academic education. So um, they do coursework for online coursework for, and depending on how fast they move through the program, but usually for around um, 18 months, they are doing academics. And it's a very interactive academic. We're actually working hard on developing online simulations, which is when you think about this communication issue, you can really teach some very good skills um, around communication. And, and then they go into their clinical sites. So uh, we may have at any period of time around 200 to 250 in clinical sites across the country. But because they're in all 50 states, um, we are able to find those sites for them. Um, but we work very hard. We have a staff of about 40 regional clinical faculty whose job it is to find help the student find those sites, assess those sites to see if they're a good learning environment and facilitate and provide some services to the preceptor too as, um, as we go along. And we are really working hard on that and are putting a whole team of people on that just to really focus because if we don't have good uh, we, without good preceptors and a good clinical education, we don't have anything. It's an interesting yes. question earlier, higher up, um, asking about policymakers. I'm just trying to look at that. Is there any movement by policymakers, the government, to work on the problem, or is it different areas, institutions stepping into the gap? Um, there is a focus by the government. <clears throat> when I talk about the Center for Disease Control, uh, and uh, there are actually two pieces of legislation that we are advocating for right now. So we do have legislators who have signed on to help us sponsor the bills that will get the funding um, to assist with um, this data collection project um, to make sure that every state has the funding in order to make that happen. Um, so we also recently in the last five years, and I saw that Linda Cole is on here, but we did have funding to examine outcomes in birth centers and um, <clears throat> to see to show that as a valuable model to be able to demonstrate that that was a valuable model. So there are um, projects going on, but I think there could be much more. Um, we also, I should say, um, we have funding uh, that is available for many um, universities. Our university is just one of um, that receive funding from the federal government to provide scholarships and services, especially to um, students of color, so that we can help to increase the diversity of the workforce. So there are, there are definitely are things coming, um, funding coming from, you know, the, from the government. Um, hospitals themselves need to always step up to the plate, and most of them do. Some of them, um, you know, I deal with this every day, talking to hospitals about why it is important that they allow students to come in um, and be educated in their institutions. Uh, so that's an ongoing conversation. Most of them do, though. I want to make that a point. Um, um, but there are still that say, why should I allow a student in here? It just increases my liability. There's a lot of talk around the liability. Um, and especially that's interesting in the United States is we don't have universal health care. Um, I wish we did. <laughs> I think that life would be much better for many families if we did, but we don't. So. I know that the, well, I, I gather that um, 
across the states there seems to be different kind of rules in different states is there any move to have a kind of a professional regulatory body of midwifery that can bring all these different types of midwives and labor and delivery nurses to a common standard well there is and it you know the there's two things that go on. One is licensure, which is driven by state by state. And then there's certification, which is a national initiative. So most midwives in the United States are certified by the American Midwifery Certification Board if they graduate from a certified midwife or a certified nurse midwife program. And then we also have our certified professional midwives and they take a national certification exam um, by, um, that is presented by NARM. So, so we do have standardization. All of our programs are based on the ICM standards as the underlying basis, and then they grow from there, whatever specialty that program may want to add in as their, like at Frontier, we do much around rural, rural and underserved care, since that's one of our focuses. Um, so we do have standardization of midwifery there's still some uh, lay midwives um, or uh, that practice, but um, in terms of uh, really working on this, we, I think we've come a very long way. Uh, in state by state, it's a licensure issue. Um, so you have to be licensed to, to practice in the state in which you, um, you are practicing. So you may need to meet those requirements um, as well as the national requirements. Okay. Someone's asked there if there's any scope for partnering, partnering with other um, bodies of midwifery. She's actually said the Royal College of Midwives, which is a UK one here, to facilitate opportunities for nurses or midwives, I guess, to complete training with midwives in other countries. I think that would be great. <laughs> I think that is a great idea. I'd love to talk to somebody more about that idea. I think we have a so lot in, to in learn United, from each other, don't we, really? Right. In the UK, it, do midwives provide um, primary care in gynecology? No? Is, I, I, I'm looking at Seal's comment. Um, no, we don't do gynecology. If we're midwifery, we're just obstetric. Well, not obstetric. We're midwifery trained. <laughs> uh -huh. We don't do uh -huh. gynecology at all, so it would be different. Um, it would be different. There may be some, though, some part of the education that would be helpful to cross train um, and uh, look at different models. See, then that's why when I was talking about um, primary care, I think it's important that um, we have enough midwives that are in these clinics providing primary care, not just maternity care, um, because mm -hmm. I do think we have the expertise to help women be healthier and help women have healthy families and think that's part of our role. Um, a huge part of our role is just teaching. Yes, we agree there. And the midwifery yes. is definitely involved in primary care as well. Um, because women are at that right, are in the right uh, place at that time, aren't they, to listen to health education yes. messages, right. etc. So yes, that's definitely. I, I'm, I'm smiling at Cecilia's comment about standards and guidelines and measurements being all different because you can find it by working even within one small area, like here in the, in the west of Scotland, if you work in one hospital, they have um, slightly different or quite sometimes big differences in measurement type things. Um, so we all have to learn the ways of the local uh, um, trust, etc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I yes. know. I do. I do know Seal. Um, that and yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult, but I, I do think with um, that's. I still think we could learn from each other, and I know Seal knows that because she's done a lot of that too. Um, I totally agree with you there. Um, um, it, with social media and everything, you definitely you do get more um, comparison. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the use of Entonox in the states, which in the UK we've used since. Um, Oh, the year dot um, and we have no protocols and procedures and I remember Cecilia asking me you know what are the protocols for using <laughs> Entonox 
well, we've used it all the time. <laughs> we have no protocols for that because it's been in use forever. <laughs> so there's, <laughs> there's always going to be huge differences. But they're all, they're, the one thing that brings us all together is that childbirth is a normal event. And we mm -hmm. all experience it in the same way. Midwives should be the custodians of normality and should be identifying deviations and then bringing in the appropriate people there. But anyway, we've only got well a minute said, left. Well said. We've only got a minute left. So have we got any more burning questions before we conclude? Thank you, everybody. I can only say thank you as well, um, Susan. That was a fabulous um Summary, I'm, I'm sure it's a very big subject altogether, but yes, that's it. Is. So, yes. I so thank you very much. And I'm sorry that um, see, uh, that Jane had to disappear like that. Well, that was a good reason, let's face it. So, that's right, go on about that. And, and thank you very much for taking place. I see we've got some applause in the audience from SLW. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'll just conclude the session then. Um, there is still discussion going on in the in the chat because I mentioned it. <laughs> um, okay, so. I will just move on. Oh, right, there's your final. Seen this one before. Be the change yeah. you wish to see in the world. Yes, that is a fabulous saying. Quote. Okay, thank so I thank you very much, Dr. Stone, and um, I'll just turn.